John, thank you so much for the humbling introduction. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here at this conference. Um, and in the audience, we have publishers, technologists, uh, people who understand AI very well, uh, people who have um, a basic understanding of the business challenges that can be solved with AI. Uh, so I'm going to dive deep into a bit of underlying techniques uh, to see what are the challenges and how we can solve them. Um, there were really interesting talks at this conference, and especially at the pre-SSP conference, uh, where uh, in the concluding remark, Dr. Coleman talked about blockchain and AI and how it is changing publishing. I was also part of the roundtable discussion with Anne Michelle um, about uh, what are the implications of AI for the publishing industry, and we presented uh, a summary on Monday uh, before this conference. So some of these things are going to be repetitive for the audience who were uh, involved in those discussions. Uh, but before I dive deep into uh, the challenges, uh, let me get back to the roots of where it all started for me. Um, my research, particularly for my PhD at University of Oxford, was related to medical image processing and computer vision. Uh, what you are seeing over here uh, is a slice of uh, a rat heart, and a rat heart is that big. But when you take high-resolution images, it translates into two terabytes of data for one small heart. Um, and there are these like slices um, across uh, the cross-sections of the heart. When you zoom in, on the right side, you can see this is uh, the visualization that was published on BBC. Uh, it's a hole that big of a wall uh, where that small heart is visualized. And on the left, you can see the zoomed-in image where the cellular structures are visible. And you can see the cell types um, in the picture. So one of the challenges was to figure out what are the cell types over there, what are the my myocytes, uh, and what are the fibroblasts. And for that, you can train an AI uh, to classify um, uh, the algorithm that which cell types there. And these are the same kind of algorithms that you can probably figure out that if an article submitted to um, a submission system is bogus or not. Uh, so this is one of the reputational problem for publisher uh, when it is find that like, you know, uh, there is an article which was not correct and there are retractions required. So can we predict these kind of things using the same algorithms? Uh, at the same time, uh, even though my research, my background is in computer science and uh, I went into computational biology, but to understand that I took a lab experimental techniques course uh, during my PhD where I worked in the lab to sequence my own DNA and compared it with chimpanzee, of course, it was a good match. Uh, and as part of that, before going into lab, they give, they give you a course on ethics, uh, medical ethics, because you are conducting experiments, you need to know the value of life, uh, about animal life. Uh, so this is one of the problems that we discussed in our ethics class, which was a classic uh, trolley problem. Um, and the problem is if there is a trolley which is going that way and there are five people in that line, um, and if there is a human, let's say, I'm there and I have a decision to make to change the course of that, to divert this trolley uh, to a part where there is one person, what I would do. Uh, this is the decision for me. But let's say if there are multiple scenarios of that, let's say there are two parts, and then on both parts, uh, there is a four-year-old kid and there is an 80-year-old uh, man, uh, which one would you go for? Uh, and how would you do it, and what would be your dilemma? Uh, in any case, you are taking a life, uh, which is more valuable. If it is Einstein, uh, would you go for it? So, like, yeah, it is an endless debate. But once you start to have these human being replaced with AI, then how would you program that AI, and how would it make that decision? Uh, we are talking about driverless cars. Google is one company uh, which is working on driverless cars, but so are others. Uh, there is Uber, who has research centers working on driverless cars to replace human drivers. And if there is a case uh, where there are two cars, one by Uber and one by Google, and they both are faced with the decision to either hit a man or go for another path where there is a cat, or go for a cliff where the driver himself or the owner of the car would die, or their customer would die, uh, which decision one company would make compared to other. So it means there has to be a government regulation around it that how the AI should be programmed, and there are definitely ethical considerations involved. Um, and there's a lot of debate between tech titans, uh, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, 
Elon Musk is quite uh, vocal about, uh, about killer robots and what is the demise of AI. Uh, even you can see uh, a comment from, uh, from Musk over there. I've talked to Mark about this. His understanding of the subject is limited. Uh, so everyone is talking about like, you know, what is the right thing or what is the wrong thing. Uh, and as a result of that, US tech giants unite to ensure uh, that AI is developed safely and ethically. Partnership on AI and OpenAI are two such initiatives where uh, Facebook and big companies, Google, uh, Tesla, are coming together uh, to have responsible development of underlying AI algorithms. So while this discussion is continuing overall in the tech industry, and I'm sure in the publishing industry as well, that whether we should, uh, what is the right thing to do. But one thing is clear that we need to adopt this technology and take advantage of it, while at the same time make policy uh, decisions to address the underlying ethical questions. Uh, the progress shouldn't be stalled because of these issues. Andrew Eng, who is founder of Google Brain Project and former chief scientist at Beidou, uh, at, and a Stanford prof professor, he said AI is the new electricity. And can we imagine a life without AI? We can't even imagine our life without cell phones, uh, let alone electricity. Um, so AI is going to transform the world around us in the same way electricity today uh, means to us. Um, and right, left, and center, every day we hear some news that how AI is revolutionizing uh, the world around us. One of the example is Google beating World Alpha Go champion. Um, and the Go champion, uh, Go is one of the very complicated games, and that was a big victory for AI. But what happened, like after defeating the world champion, that AI played against itself and mastered the game to an extent where the world's top champions looking at the game played by AI were surprised and couldn't understand the moves uh, made by the AI to play that game. Um, artificial intelligence can spot a skin cancer as well as a trained doctor. And fund management by robots is here, um, and it is beginning to make a stock uh, investment. This is not all. Like These are some of the big companies that we are seeing, like in previous slides, Google, Facebook, Uber, Tesla, um, who are going for these kind of approaches. But there are um, companies who can't like, you know, afford to or have dedicated AI teams because this is a skill or expertise that companies are trying to develop within their technology teams. Um, so there are thousands and thousands of people who are on Kaggle platform uh, who are looking for challenges to solve. They are machine learning and AI experts. Um, and you can go on the site and look at these challenges. So the first challenge that you can see, it is put up by the US government, uh, Passenger Screening Algorithm Challenge. And the bounty for that is 1.5 million, if anyone like, you know, the best algorithm that performs against the data that they provided. And the challenge over there is, that on the security screening, if you are singled out, which I occasionally am, uh, <laughs> is, is that like, you know, how do you do the false positive reduction uh, to make sure that uh, the lag time is lowest because it results in cost and increased like, you know, uh, spending. Uh, similarly, for the Zillow price, Zillow home value prediction, this is another challenge put up by Zillow, and that is for 1.2 million. You can see there are 3,780 teams trying to solve that problem, um, and the award will be given to the successful team. So if any of you, uh, of your businesses and companies, looking at a business problem and trying to solve, and you don't have AI expertise, you can take it to Kaggle platform, um, and that is a very valuable resource. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to, as businesses, we need to understand the underlying um, complexity and understanding of what goes beneath that. So you have a big understanding of what are the business problems that can be solved with AI. Uh, so there are many experts in the audience. Um, I spoke with John and Daniel Hook and uh, Dr. Coleman and some other people here um, who are, uh, have very good understanding of the subject. And I'm sure many of the people in the audience are, but I'm going to go through a very basic and generalized understanding of the overall techniques um, in this space. And this is a very naive generalization. Um, so it doesn't apply to all of the problems, but it just to simplify the problem. So hiring is one of the one of the use cases that I am using over here to demonstrate the case, uh, because what is happening in all of the examples for Google and for self-driving car, it's all about decision making, whether you can make effective decisions. 
And why you want to make decisions? Because either you are trying to increase productivity or profits, or you are trying to decrease error rates or your losses. And that's what is called a cost function in artificial intelligence or an objective function uh, in mathematical optimization. Uh, and thinking of it like, you know, very uh, simplistically, for hiring at Colvis, uh, for our wisdom.ai team and Colvis team, um, we recently advertised eight job posts. And we scanned through almost like 400 CVs uh, for those posts where people applied. And then there was interviews, and then there were tests, and we offered job to people. Um, and it is same for most of the organization. So we have certain criteria for a particular organization, let's say. They say we will give 30% weight to test score, 20% weight to interview score, and 50% to past experience and achievement. And then if that total score is greater than 80, that person is going to be hired. But what often happens is that I hire someone, and then they perform very well, and then I confidence in the scores that I assign, 80, 50, 20, and 30, the numbers in blue, or that person doesn't perform, and I think, oh, I should have considered this factor as well, or you know, this factor is probably not 30%, but 32%, and I continuously adjust it in my head. Um, and then people who I didn't hire, some of them go on to perform at other companies, and some of them underperform. So my right decision is the people who went to other companies who didn't perform. Um, and by learning through it, I'm constantly optimizing these values in my brain. What if I can take these weights in my brain and then take it into a computer model and then share it with the rest of the organizations who can also feed their data into it so we can all share this hiring process together and learn from the whole big data which is out there on hiring and people's skills. Um, so what we are effectively trying to do, so AI is pretty much, and machine learning is something which can learn through experiences to optimize these weights. And we can feed historical data to AI in that way. And there are some other examples in a similar way, where the stock prices will rise. So for each day in the past, um, I know that yesterday, what was the weather, what was the inflation rate, what was the unemployment rate, uh, and all of these factors, and whether I know whether the stock value for a particular stock went up or down as a result, and I have that data for the last uh, decades. I can feed all of that data in, and for tomorrow's value, or today's value, I can start to predict what is going to happen. Same goes for the chess move. I have a position one for the board, position two, and I'm trying to figure out what is the possible next move. But for all the past games, I know given a particular board configuration, what was the next move that led to success or a failure. And I can play multiple games in the past and then feed that dead data in to see the game outcome. It all is based on like, you know, very simple mathematics, as you would agree. Uh, so this is the cost function I was talking about. This is the deep neural network uh, underlying it. If you are interested in the underlying mathematics, please feel free to go to uh, uh, Coursera to take a course by Andrew Eng. Uh, this is really exciting and very simple course. So specifically talking about the research ecosystem, uh, manuscript is acceptance is one of the examples when through a submission system a manuscript comes through and you want to see as a editor I look at the paper and I say okay whether it is relevant to the general scope if it is not I reject it on the first instance so I have a criteria over there my second one is what about the content of the article uh, whether it is good enough and then there is another factor another factor in the past I have historical data about these factors that which article I accepted resulted in high citations and low citations, and then I can feed that data to AI to start to predict what is going to happen for a particular manuscript that I received today. Author disambiguation is another challenging problem where you can apply the same kind of techniques. So for example, I have John Smith and I have John Smith. If two John Smith have the same ORCID ID, they may be the same people. If two John Smith, one is working on history and another is working on physics, probably they are not the same people. And I can look at the data in the past and start to classify that whether the authors are same. And there are more examples about keyword discipline assignment to articles, uh, assigning institutional affiliation, uh, identifying bogus articles, which is like, you know, identifying outliers, uh, predicting citations. These are the topics that are going to be discussed in the following talks. But there are, again, ethical considerations. And to give a very specific example, uh, if we have uh, an AI integrated into a manuscript submission system for a journal, which has double-blind peer review, 
and it suggests to editors that which article would perform better and bring more citations to boost impact factor or any other metric optimization of whatever you call uh, uh, an impact or an alt metric, um, then what kind of model would be ethical or non-ethical? Because as a business foundation and as a principal foundation, we agree that it has to be double uh, blind. So the model one that we have considers from a submission manuscript system to which AI is integrated, is looking at the topic coverage of that particular manuscript, the prior work which it references, the current work that it has, the results, and based on that, it looks at like, you know, what, whether it should be bring better citations or less citations, but there is another factor which is in model two, citation history of co-authors, which is statistically speaking is a really important factor. If you put it in a model and actually see the results, it's actually an important factor. If they're co-authors of an article, which historically got all good citations for their article, they're going to get good citations, but it is against the principle, because that's not how we do blind peer review. So the question is whether you would isolate and create a firewall between an AI algorithm and the data available it has from the manuscript system uh, that is there, because otherwise the principle of double blind peer review is not there. So the factor should be made open uh, and you know there should be transparency for any AI company uh, which is operating in tech space or publishing space, um, and that is really really important. So coming back to a bigger R&D ecosystem, not only publishing, publishing industry, and as we discussed, that it is all about decision making. We want to make better decision. Two trillion dollar R&D industry is there, and the ecosystem is uh, the participants are industry who is trying to figure out that how to bring products faster to the market, how to collaborate with people in industry and academia, how to find cure for cancer, or build the next, develop the next drug. Uh, academia, who is trying to figure out that uh, what are our competitiveness, which areas to develop, which areas for funding to go for, uh, which new departments to develop, which new courses to launch. Governments are trying to figure out that whether our economy is competitive, and let's say if China is doing quite well in AI, uh, whether Europe should be investing in AI as well at the same scale. Uh, publishing industry, always trying to figure out how to optimize business model, uh, how to launch new journals, which are the emerging topics and areas. Publishing industry is also trying to figure out who are the star authors, how to attract them. And funding bodies don't want to be in a space where they are funding one area and there is another funding agency funding the same area. So you want to have a whole spectrum uh, where you can make such decisions. And the output, publications, grants, clinical trials, and patents, they all are important for making such decisions. And what AI can do is to cross and combine all of this data set together to bring these insights to these stakeholders so they can make decisions very, very fast and effectively so we get much more progress for this $2 trillion R&D industry. So if cure for cancer is five years away, it is there in two years' time at a much significantly lower rate. And that's the goal. If you look at particularly for publishers and the overall workflow cycle that we talk about, going from reading and discovery to doing research to writing and submission and then to publication. Uh, there are then particular examples of how AI can, can help. So as a researcher, uh, there are two million papers that come out, and I can't keep tabs on all of them. So I want AI to, I want to have a personal assistant in my pocket, um, and if I'm reading papers in my library, I want it to suggest me papers. I want every day in the morning on work to tell me that these are the emerging areas, these are the papers to read. Uh, probably summarize it in voice and tell me, uh, so I, rather than finding 10 out of 100 to recommend, uh, it should summarize and tell me what they are and what they're talking about so I can go to my office and then start to look at what they are. Um, during research, find targets for drug developments so automatically, uh, like, you know, culling down some of the options which would result in more cost. And optimization of reaction time and cost when there are already uh, products out there, uh, like, you know, Chem Planner and uh, Reaccess. Um, and find collaborators, automated data analysis in the phase of writing and submission if I write a paper because all of these stages are integrated. Suggest missing references. So before I, sometimes I publish a 
paper or send my paper. Um, and then I get a reviewer's response that, oh, you didn't mention this study, which was just published a month ago, uh, which is very relevant to this, and you should be like, you know, mentioning this. Uh, that happened actually at the time of my first year of PhD when I submitted a report, and the supervisor asked me that uh, this is like something which is missing. So if we extend that for publishers, there are more um, use cases. Publishers want to find a star author, see which are the new and returning authors, uh, monitor and analyze their own journals and see which journals to launch. Uh, institution wants to measure institutional performance and compare with other institutions, identify key researchers, um, and for governments, industry, and individual researchers, like all of the stakeholders want to make decisions which makes best use of the $2 trillion which are floating in this industry. So going into specifics, uh, looking at this particular article, uh, which is uh, I published in 2009 in Philosophical Transactions of Royal Society from University of Oxford, United Kingdom, with a keyword in silico. So Tahir Mansuri, this is my article. There are five other articles which mention Tahir Mansuri, and there are 20 others which I am not, and they are also Tahir Mansuri. So AI is able to interconnect them and build my profile and say, okay, Tahir Mansuri has five publications in these areas related to these subject areas. And then it looks at grant funding and also put in my profile that this is the grant funding that he received. And these are the patents that commercialization of efforts that is there. Um, and then I can start to build a profile for University of Oxford because I can figure out where, what are the funding and grants to Oxford University, what are the clinical trials they're working on. And then I can map the whole research universe around all of these entities. So this is what we did at wisdom.ai. Um, so we have data sets about research funding, patents, uh, ontology, 93 million publications, 1 billion citations, and we apply machine learning and AI algorithms to that, and we provide intuitive dashboards for quick decision making, which are ready to consume. Um, at the time of Brexit, we launched uh, a dashboard analyzing the impact of uh, funding on the UK, that after Brexit, what would happen and how institutions will be impacted. Uh, that got coverage in Wired and Fast Company News. And recently, we analyzed one, build, one road initiative using our data that we generated using wisdom.ai, that what are the collaboration patterns between China and the countries which are part of one belt, one road initiative, which is China's 900 billion investment in the infrastructure of multiple countries. Um, so in wisdom.ai, you can look through uh, funding, topics, publishers, journals, institutions. I'll just quickly glance through it. Uh, these are some dashboards on the topic. So this is Zika virus. Like you can see what is the citation trajectory, what is the funding grants. Uh, here is electronic cigarette, uh, graphene, trypsin. Uh, we have dashboards for more than 80,000 institutions around the world um, in every country and any institution. Uh, we are tracking more than 800 billion in grant funding from 97 funding bodies. Um, and we have research intelligence about every single uh, country out there. You can look at insights for publishers that is again collected through AI. It took us one and a half year to compile all of that data and run it through automated algorithm with only a team of 20 people. Um, so that is a like big feat compared to I would say uh, the similar databases that are built with a team of hundreds of people. Uh, so this is completely automated. So we have analytics. You can deep down into every journal for every publisher and look at who are the new authors, who are the returning authors, uh, what is the pattern around it. This is just to give example of how we are applying AI to build that research landscape for the publishing industry and the ecosystem. Just final points on this slide uh, to conclude my talk. Uh, there's a lot of worries about job replacement. Um, and that is something, a topic that we entertained at our roundtable discussion uh, on Monday. Um, so my comment on that was that uh, if you are uh, a driver and there is a driverless car that is being developed, there is no higher cognition level of driving. Either the machine will drive it or I will drive it. There is no other option. But in research, it's a creative work. And there are studies published about what kind of jobs will be automated. If there is cure for cancer is 10 years away uh, by having AI helping me, we would be able to find it faster. We would be able to make decisions which take our time otherwise. Knowledge creation has no limit. So it will only free us up 
to do higher level cognition tasks that we would be able to do much faster. Of course, there are some mechanical tasks in there which are repetitive. They will be facilitated by AI, but in this particular industry, there won't be as much of job replacement. Um, algorithms need careful monitoring in terms of ethics. Uh, financial industry was the first one to adopt uh, AI uh, from engineering and computer science department at Oxford and any other university in the world. Uh, a lot of people go into financial industry and investment banking and do algorithmic analysis and uh, uh, development for the financial model, but they couldn't even predict the financial crisis. So AI and algorithmic models uh, are, have certain capability, but they are not 100% correct. Uh, data standards, that is really, really important for AI, uh, because when we get data from publishers, uh, there is Crossref, which is doing a fantastic job at standardizing uh, data, and there is Metadata 2020 and other initiatives. Uh, but for funding agencies, the data is sometimes available as CSV, sometimes it is available as zip file, sometimes it is uh, through API, so there is a greater need for standardizing all of the data uh, for coming from all of the stakeholders in the ecosystem. Uh, the last thing I, will, I want to touch base on, uh, there is a lot of buzz around these two topics during this conference, uh, starting from pre-conference and all the way leading up to the last session uh, about blockchain and AI, and it would be interesting to see how uh, they interplay with each other because AI is all about centralizing intelligence. If I'm developing an AI system, I'm saying that I want as much data in one place from all the sources, so I have central intelligence, and I can make decisions based on that. Um, but we don't want government agencies uh, to have access to our Facebook and WhatsApp and all sort of data to build a comprehensive profile of us because that scares us. We don't want central intelligence on us in that way. Uh, so there is AI goes for centralized intelligence, but at the same time, what blockchain is saying is we don't trust banks, we don't tr trust governments, we don't trust the entities involved. Um, and can we decentralize the control uh, by using blockchain technology. Uh, so probably we need to go towards uh, some sort of a mechanism where the intelligence is decentralized and we are achieving the both goal while we are able to progress science faster um, and while uh, no one has control of that at the same time. Um, so that concludes my talk and thanks a lot for giving me an opportunity. Thank you so much. Cheers.